on this Bible chart, the second ball on the chart is a blue ball or a black ball should be representing the second verse of the Bible. And that's what we mean by the overthrow of the world that then was. You see, it's a dark period. It's a chaotic period. It's a period of judgment. It's a flood as pictured in the second verse of our Bible. So we come now to this general study, the rebellion and overthrow of the first social system, the anti-chaotic age, the age before that chaotic period as pictured on your chart and as described in the second verse of the Bible, when an angel ruled this planet Earth. The anti-chaotic age extended from the original creation of the heavens and the earth and all things therein to the rebellion and overthrow of the first cosmos, our social order, on the earth. It was the dateless period between Genesis 1, when the earth was finished and inhabited in the beginning, and Genesis 1-2, when the earth was first flooded, destroying all life therein. It takes in that unknown time during the first flooded, destroying period on the earth. It takes in that unknown time during the period that the earth has been cursed and Lucifer has fallen. In Ezekiel 28, 11 to 17, it is stated of Lucifer, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. This teaches that there was a period of perfection and sinlessness on the earth before its curse and the chaotic state as described in Genesis 1-2. So we call this period the anti-chaotic age. During this age, spirit beings rule the earth and other planets, and it might be called the dispensation of angels. This administration of angels was evidently a moral our probationary period designed to test the angels before trusting them into the eternal state. So we call it a dispensation, and a dispensation, as we have already seen, is a moral or probationary period during which time God tests free moral agents according to a fixed standard of conduct. All spirit beings must of necessity be tested like human free moral agents to see if they will obey God before they are trusted with higher and eternal responsibilities. Angels were fresh from the hand of God in creation and had been created with free wills, so they were capable of making their own choice as to whether they wanted to obey God or not. They had to learn by the experience of being tested whether they would or would not obey the Creator. They had to learn obedience. Even Jesus Christ, when he came into this world, were told in Hebrews 5, that he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Angelic beings had to learn that God was just and holy in all of his ways, and that he could and should be trusted in all things that could not be made known to free moral agents at one time, and which they could not have had created within them. They had to learn that God was the supreme moral governor of the universe, and that all creatures should consecrate themselves to the same end to which God himself was consecrated, the highest good of the universe and all creatures therein. They had to prove themselves true to God in order to get the rewards for obedience. They had to learn that God's word was true concerning penalties for disobedience. God's dispensational dealings were for the same purpose in those days or in that period as it is today when he is testing free moral agents in the human race. These dealings are fully described in a lesson one, as we have already seen, and they should be reviewed by the student in order that he might get a clear conception of the period that uh, spirit beings rule this earth. If Lucifer and many other spirit beings had remained true to God, there would have been no universal curse on the earth and no need of a recreation of the atmospheric heavens and of the earth as recorded in Genesis 1, 3 through 2, 25. In that case, man and the present animals on the earth never would have been created. The Bible record 
of the first curse on the earth and the cancellation of the administration of angels over the earth should make the present administrators fear God because of their rebellion. And they should come to know that God will deal with human free moral agents just as drastically and definitely as he dealt with the angelic free moral agents of old. Peter warns the present human rebels on the earth this way, whose judgment now for a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels at sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved under judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example uh, unto those that should live ungodly, and delivered just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Then he added, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. Second Peter 2, verses 4 to 9. Jude also speaks of the judgment of God upon both angels and men in the past for rebellion. Read verses 5 to 7 of the book of Jude. Paul gives the example of how God cut off Israel because of rebellion and unbelief and warned the Gentiles to take heed lest he spare not thee. Romans 11, 1 through 26. Paul also gives the example of the Gentile world that did not appreciate the knowledge of God, but became vain in their imaginations, and hard and stubborn in their rebellion against God until God gave them over to vile affections to destroy themselves. Romans 1, 16-32. Many other examples could be given of God's judgment upon men in various ages, as we shall later note in a study of the ages and dispensations themselves. But these are sufficient here to show why God had to deal with the angelic administrator of the administrators of the earth long before the days of Adam. The ways in which Lucifer was perfect until iniquity was found in him prove that angels were placed under certain restrictions for the purpose of testing them. Tests are absolutely necessary for any material thing that is made to discover whether it will do what it is, desi is, de is designed and made for. The same thing is especially true of free moral agents who are capable of voluntary choices concerning moral tests. There would be no object in creating free wills if there were not laws for them to obey and to restrict and guide them in their association with all other creatures in society. There would be no need in creating creatures capable of voluntary obedience without also stating the right and wrong ways so that they can make their choice which way they will go. It is re written even of the sinless one, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 7 to 10. It can be seen, therefore, that sinless creatures can learn obedience to the right ways without committing sin. They can learn by experience how to know God and to walk in his ways without going through any degree of experience in sin. For it is written of the tested and tried Son of God, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. First Peter 2, 21-25. Also, the second, fourth, and fifth chapters of Hebrews gives us several statements along this line. Neither angels nor men would have had to sin in order to learn obedience and to be tried by moral tests. So the old theory that sin is necessary in order for free moral agents to learn obedience is not true. In the eternal future, when men will multiply forever in the earth, new generations will be true to God from childhood. And they will learn all necessary obedience without committing sin. For in Revelation 21, we have the fact that there will be no more sin, death, tears, former things are passed away. There are some of the richest studies awaiting you in the coming lessons. 
things that will be worth millions of dollars to you and your friends and loved ones. So whatsoever you do, don't fail to continue this Bible course with us. And I repeat again, send for the lessons and for the chart, and get the most out of these studies. If it is necessary to test human free wills and even the Son of God, it certainly would be necessary to test spirit beings for the same purpose. How was God to know which of the spirit beings would remain true and which ones would not until they were tested and either proved faithful or unfaithful? They could not have had this knowledge, and God could not have known this unless he had tested them as we see that he did do. Naturally, all free wills will not choose the same things and exercise the creative free choice powers in the same ways and in the same degree of willful obedience or disobedience. This has been demonstrated by free wills ever since they were created. This certainly is clear of all present free moral agents who know of themselves that they can make free and voluntary choice concerning any and every detail of life. It was not until Adam and Eve actually sinned that God knew the full results of the test. So all creatures must be tested. Friends, again, we come to you with another message on God's plan for man. The last time we were discussing the free moral agency of angels and how that is absolutely necessary to test all free moral agents to see whether they would remain true to God or not. It was not until Adam and Eve actually sinned that God knew the full results of their test. It was not until man had proved such a failure before the flood that God regretted having made him in the first place. Genesis 6, 5 to 7 said God repented that he made man. It was not until God came down to see the rebellion of the post-antediluvians Sodom, Gomorrah, and others that God took action against them as recorded in the 11th chapter of Genesis. There God said, let us go down and see the children of men, see the city they are building. And again God came down with two angels to see if Sodom and Gomorrah were as wicked as it had been reported to them. So it is with every free moral agent of any period. Each has to be tested and purged of all possibility of falling before God places him in an eternal state and gives him eternal responsibility. In God's moral government, there must be laws for all creatures, and each creature must be assigned some particular responsibility so that the universe will run in perfect harmony. God could not rule free moral agents or free wills if each was free to do as he pleased. No government could long endure with such a plan. This is plainly evident to anyone who lives in any kind of modern society. If all are free to do as they please, and they could not depend upon someone to carry out that plan and to go govern properly, leave it all up to them, and every person did as he pleased, then human government would come to chaos and ruin. It is even necessary, therefore, in human affairs that each person do something and be responsible for something if anything is to be accomplished in human society. This is true of the smallest of the greatest project undertaken by free wills. The greater the project, the greater the responsibility for those who are trusted for its completion. The greater the project, the greater the need for many persons to be responsible for some definite part in such a plan. How much more true would it be in running the vast universe? God is methodical in everything in his hand has fixed laws that govern every detail of the vast universe. Each free will is given a part in carrying out the mutual plan for all concerned. God has a plan for the life and work of each creature and has a purpose for each material thing created. Every planet, every sun, every moon, and every star must run in its own creative orbit. Each one of them must run on time or there would soon be nothing dependable in, pla in the planetary system. Times and seasons would be thrown out of order, and all life on all planets would soon be destroyed. So it is with a moral creation. God did not make the moral creation to be chaos and ruin, and each person to be a lawless and irresponsible creature to cause governmental function to seize or to do as he pleases. 
These must. There must be some order. There has to be. And someone to keep order. There must be one law for all in order to assure justice to all alike. There must be voluntary and mutual cooperation on the part of each free will for all to fit into and carry out the plan for the best good of all. Each creature must be held responsible for his own acts. He must be rewarded for obedience or punished for disobedience, or no government can properly function for the best good of all. If God is to hold the respect and willful obedience of all creatures, then he must be fair and just to all, meeting out punishments for sin and distributing rewards for obedience. Government by rewards and penalties for all alike is the only just form of government and the only one that can, that can continue forever. When government becomes corrupt and shows respect to persons and injustice to some and special favors to others, then it ceases to carry out its own purpose. This would soon lead to rebellion and eventual overthrow. If rebels against proper and just government were permitted to continue to openly rebel without punishment, there would be no incentive for others to remain true and support the government. It would soon fall. So to be just, God is forced by circumstances to deal with rebels against his government and put down each rebellion if he is to continue his government for the best good of all. He is likewise obligated to reward the faithful and preserve proper and just government for the faithful. On these grounds, every child of God can claim rewards and benefits that are promised to them by God and the many promises of Scripture. Every child of God can have perfect health, freedom from want and pain. He can have happiness and untold blessings if he will but do a few simple things and obey a few simple laws of rewards and blessings. These laws will be dealt with in some measure in each lesson, but they will be fully enlarged upon in special lessons in due time. We must first get a general idea of God's dealings with free moral agents before we can take up a full study proving what is his plan for present free moral agents. The Bible teaches that one-third of the angels proved untrue, as did all the subjects of the first social order on the earth over whom Lucifer ruled before the days of Adam. Just how many rulers and subjects of other planets rebel is not definitely stated, but we do learn from many scriptures that there are thrones and kingdoms in the heavens as well as on earth, visible and invisible. Colossians 1, 15 to 18 says, By him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Scriptures tell us that God charged some of his angels with folly. Job 4, 18. And that over one third of God's angels rebel with Lucifer. For in Revelation 12, 3 to 12, we have the fact that the dragon drew a third part of the stars of heaven. They're called there Satan's angels. Also in Matthew 24, 41, we have the fact that hell is prepared for Satan and his angels. The Bible reveals that redeemed human beings are to judge angels in the future. 1 Corinthians 6, 3, that women are to cut their hair. Not to cut their hair, but to keep it long as a sign of subjection to their own husbands so that angels will have a good example of subjection to God, according to 1 Corinthians 11.10. That the purpose of the millennial reign of Christ is to gather in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Ephesians 1.10. The Bible further reveals that it is God's plan to rid the earth of all rebellion eventually, as plainly stated in 15, 24 to 28 of 1 Corinthians, that all rebels of every kind and of every realm will have, will have to finally acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11. And also that Christ worked to reconcile both the things in heaven and things in earth will be eventually accomplished, and that Christ has actually triumphed over all rebels in the cross, and it only remains now for the time to come when he actually takes action and put down 
puts down such rebellion. Many are the wonderful teachings of the Word of God. We cannot possibly go into every detail of the Scriptures, but these are sufficient to give you the idea that God's government is a correct and a just one and must be respected and obeyed by all free moral agents in order to receive rewards in the future. Now then, concerning the angels, what means of reconciliation God gave these spirit beings and the first rebels on the earth is not known, but there must have been such means. For God, as revealed in our Bible, has always been loving and merciful and kind and just to all creation. This is his nature, and it would be contrary to his own being to have to cut them off without some means of reconciliation and without giving them a chance to lay down their arms of rebellion. It must be remembered that spirit beings are immortal in body, in soul, and in spirit, and are not subject to physical death, which is the separation of the inner man from the outer man, James 2.26. So the result of their penalty could not have been the same as was that in the case of the human rebels. They will, however, be tormented in literal fire and brimstone forever, just as men will be. For we read in Matthew 24.41 that hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. And in Jude 6 and 7 we read, The angels of which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved and chained under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, when after strange flesh are set forth for the suffering of vengeance and eternal fire. It must also be remembered that the Bible is not a book that deals specifically with the administration of angels, their rebellion, and the means of their reconciliation, if any, and all about their former relation to God, or with the extent to which they suffer degrees of punishment. The Bible is a book revealing the origin of all things, including the angels and man, but it primarily deals with man and his rebellion on this planet Earth, and of God's plan concerning his future. In the Bible, as we have seen before, there are hundreds of references on spirit beings, their origin, their fall, but the present work and future destiny of such beings, so many, many ideas are, are recorded and others are not. These things are made clear concerning spirit beings because of their furtherance in God's plan for man. Now then we come to the idea, the first period on your Bible chart, God's kingdom universal, God's kingdom overall, after the, after the creation of the original heavens and the earth, how long this perfect condition remained on the earth before the curse is not known. But we do know up to a certain point that men did live on the earth in, in perfection and in righteousness even before the days of Adam as we shall see. Now then, we mentioned last time about the free moral agency of angels and of men, and how that God's kingdom was one time universal. God was over all, and there wasn't one free moral agent that acted in his own selfishness or apart from the will of the Creator, and that everything was in perfect harmony with God. How long this condition remained is not known, and all speculation is valueless. In Following studies, we will show to you when rebellion started and where, and who caused the first rebellion in the world. From here on, the Bible reveals that the earth has been made perfect and inhabited two times, and that there have been two universal rebellions on the earth, and that the earth has had two sinful careers. It also records two past curses on the earth and reveals that the earth will be made new one more time and that righteousness will then dwell on the earth forever. Now we come to the study of that chaotic period as illustrated on your Bible chart, the second ball on your chart, what we call the earth's water baptism, or the earth under curse and under the first flood. Now we mentioned before that there were inhabitants on the earth before the days of Adam. Some of you may think that's a strange doctrine, but... If you listen carefully, I'm going to give you many scriptures now, the next few days, to prove to you that God has revealed to us such 
an idea. Moses' teaching on the overthrow of the pre-Adamite world, the world that existed before Adam. In Genesis 1-2, we have the fact that the earth was in existence before the Spirit of God began to move or brood upon the face of the waters that covered the earth. The conjunction and is used in, to connect the 200 separate acts of God in Genesis 1 and 2. These acts are all equally independent and important. Verse 2 is as independent of verse 1 as is all the other separate acts of God in these two chapters. In verse 1 we have the idea of the original creation of the heavens and the earth as illustrated by the first ball on your chart. Verse 2, we have the idea that the original perfect earth became chaos, became flooded, became destroyed, and made desolate and empty because of sin. The word was in verse 2 is from the Hebrew word heya, which is a verb to become, not the verb to be. It is translated became 67 times in your King James Version. For example, in Genesis 2, 7, man became a living soul. This verb is also translated becomest or becamest and came to pass over 505 times. It's also translated become 66 times and come to pass 131 times. And so it is the idea of coming to pass, not the idea of merely existing or the state of being. The phrase without form in Genesis 1-2, and let me give you that verse as a whole. We read in that verse, The earth was or became without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. The phrase without form is from the Hebrew tohu, which means desolation or confusion. It is translated waste. In Deuteronomy 32.10, and without form in Genesis 1-2 and Jeremiah 4.23. It is also translated vain in Isaiah 45.18, where we are told that God did not create the earth vain, or is as in the state that it is in in Genesis 1-2. So it became that way. It can be seen from these passages what the word really means and what the condition of the earth was in Genesis 1-2. God did not originally create the earth a waste or a ruin. That's plainly stated, as I've said, in Genesis 45-18, where you find the Hebrew word tohu, translated vain, literally meaning desolate. God did not, therefore, create the earth desolate. Yet, in Genesis 1-2, the earth is desolate. If the earth was not originally created desolate, and it is desolate in Genesis 1-2, then you can see that it became desolate since its original habitation. Even the English verb was proves it had to become desolate before it could be desolate. The Hebrew word for void in this passage is bohu, which means empty, ruin, or void. It is translated void in Genesis 1-2 and Jeremiah 4-23 in emptiness, Isaiah 34-11. The Hebrew phrase, tohu vabohu, waste and ruin, are desolate and empty, describes the chaotic condition of the earth since the beginning and before the six days of the reconstruction of the earth from that chaotic state to a second habitable state in the days of Adam a little over 6,000 years ago. Now, it is plainly stated, as I've said, that God did not create the earth as a ruin or as a waste. So if it is that way in Genesis 1-2, it became that way. We can read Genesis 1-2 literally, literally like this, then. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth became waste and ruin, desolate and empty, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That is, there was a flood on the, the earth, and the Spirit of God moved or brooded over upon the face of the waters. In these verses, we have the whole span of the creative ages taking in all the original creation of the heavens and the earth and all things therein to the six days of the restoration of the earth to a second habitable state, as I say, a little over 6,000 years ago. 
The original creations include the sun, moon, and stars, as we have already seen. In these two verses alone, Genesis 1, 1, and 2, we have the facts that in the dateless past God created the heavens, including the sun, moon, and stars, and then the earth, that the heavens were created before the earth, and that the heavens and the earth and the waters and the darkness and all things as recorded in these verses were already in existence before the Spirit of God begins to brood on the face of the waters and uh, start the work of the six days. How long the earth was waste and ruin or under this flood and in this empty state since its original habitation is not known. How long it was in existence and inhabited before it became desolate and empty, it is also not known. But why and when it was cursed and why and when it became desolate and empty is known, and we'll give you plenty of scriptures to prove that. Now then, in scripture, all cases of obscuring the sun and bringing consequent darkness and all cases of floods are a result of judgment and never of an act of creation unless Genesis 1-2 be an exception to the rule. And we have no authority to believe that this is an exception. We have, on the contrary, all the authority to believe it's just like in all other cases, an act of judgment instead of an act of creation. The fact that Moses, by inspiration, said that God told Adam to multiply and replenish the earth proves that there was a social system on the earth before the days of Adam. For Adam could not replenish anything that had not been plenished before. Some argue that the Hebrew word for replenish means fill and not refill. But this proves nothing. An examination of all places where the word replenish is used disproves this. Suppose we make the word replenish means to mean to plenish in Genesis 9-1. When God said to Noah, you multiply and replenish. Suppose we believe that the earth had never been plenished before Noah's day, and God is telling him for the first time to fill the earth. Oh, you say we know it was filled before Noah, but we don't know it was filled before Adam. Well, that's just because you haven't studied all the scriptures. That's why we're giving you this information to inform you that we do know the earth was inhabited just as much before Adam as it was inhabited before Noah. The same phrase is used in both cases, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, and Genesis 9, 1. Both men, Adam and Noah, were to refill the earth, not to fill it for the first time. Then we have other places where the word re replenish is found. Isaiah 2, 6 and 23, 2 and Jeremiah 31 and also Ezekiel 26 and 27. Try to substitute the word fill in all these places and you will see that it does not make sense. Wherever the Hebrew word mala is translated fill, it does not mean that the thing re referred to was never filled before. For example, when Joseph commanded his brethren to fill their sacks, does this mean that their sacks were never filled before and proves that they had not been filled before? No, they had no doubt been filled before many times according to the record in this case. Now then we come to Isaiah's teaching on the overthrow of the world that then was and to others. And we're going to have to save these studies for another time to deal with Isaiah's study and Ezekiel's study and Jeremiah's study and uh, the teaching of Jesus and others on the overthrow of the pre-Adamite world. We want to go slowly with you during this period to show you without the shadow of a doubt that the earth was filled before the days of Adam and was inhabited and ruled by Lucifer. I will begin reading to you plain scriptures to that effect the next time. Now, we're here to tell you that if you'll take the Bible and open it before you, follow along with us. Whenever we're telling you where to read a certain scripture, if you'll read it, you can see it says exactly what we say. And we've been studying now the last few days about the pre-Adamite world. We're just now coming to the scriptures themselves, which plainly teach that there were inhabitants on the earth before Adam, as you'll find illustrated in the first two balls of your Bible chart. 
which picture the original creation and the chaotic earth before the six days of the restoration of the earth. In fact, the first three balls on your chart. Now then, we come to Isaiah's teaching on the overthrow of the pre-Adamite world. In Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, we have conclusive proof that Lucifer ruled the earth before the days of Adam. It could not have been since Adam that he ruled the earth and fell from heaven as in this passage, for he was already a fallen creature when he came into Adam's Eden. In Adam's day he regained dominion of the earth and has been the prince of this world ever since. In this passage both Satan and the king of Babylon are in view. This is what is known as the law of double reference, that is, a visible person is immediately addressed while at the same time an invisible person who is being used or who is using the visible person as a tool to hinder the plan of God is also addressed. For example, when Jesus said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God but those that be of men. In Matthew 16:26. He did not mean that Peter was the personal devil, but that he was being used as a tool of Satan to keep Christ from getting to the cross. Hence, both Peter and Satan are addressed and involved in the one statement. To understand such passages, one should understand that part of the passage that can refer to an earthly person as referring to a man, and that part that cannot possibly refer to an earthly person as referring to the invisible person also addressed. In Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, we have some statements which cannot possibly be made of any earthly king of Babylon. The passage is universally accepted as referring to the fall of Satan. We shall quote it and then note the facts. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now this is the statement. Now this proves that the person who said this was named Lucifer, and that he was the son of the morning, and therefore no earthly man, that he fell from heaven. This could never be spoken of any earthly man. Satan is the only one in Scripture that is ever referred to as falling from heaven. Jesus Christ himself referred to it in Luke ten eighteen when he said, I beheld, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. This passage also teaches that this person, Lucifer, was cut down to the ground in his fall. That proves that the earth had already been created. And if he fell from heaven, it proves that the heaven was created, or he couldn't have fallen from heaven. And we have a mention here of nations, and proving that there had been nations on the earth, or he could not have weakened the nations by the time that he fell from heaven also revealed that Lucifer was exalted in his heart, for he said, I will exalt my throne into heaven above the stars, and I will be like the Most High. This plainly teaches that Lucifer invaded heaven and sought to cast God out and get God's universal realm, that he wanted to exalt his kingdom above the stars and above the, the clouds and in the very heaven itself, is sufficient proof of his fall and of his exaltation. It also reveals to us that he wanted to be worshipped in the congregation of the Most High. It's also very clear here that he did lead a definite rebellion against God, and that his kingdom was on the earth when he led this rebellion, not in heaven, or he could not have said, I will ascend into heaven. It was not above the stars, or he could not have said, I will ascend above the stars. It was not even above the clouds, or he could not have said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Thus, when a kingdom is located under the clouds, it has to be here on the earth. For one can stand on certain parts of the earth and still be above the clouds. 
that the ground, clouds, stars, and the heaven itself, including Lucifer and his kingdom, all these were created before the time of this fall and were in existence by the time of the fall of this person. And this passage also is very clear that it had to be before the days of Adam. For Lucifer was not a ruler of any place at the time that he came into Adam's Eden. He certainly was not the ruler of the planet Earth. Adam had dominion at that time. And if Lucifer ever ruled the earth and ever exalted himself or tried to above God and left this earth to invade heaven and was defeated and cast back down to the ground, it had to be before the days of Adam. For he had no kingdom on earth at the time of Adam. He had no authority whatsoever on the earth. Adam himself was given dominion in his day over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every creeping thing. In fact, over all the earth. And this passage also is very clear that the seat of this rebellion, the start of this rebellion, was not in heaven but under the heaven, or he could not have decided to go into heaven. And it also proves that Lucifer had a throne. And if he had a throne, he had a kingdom. And if he had a kingdom, he had some subject to rule over. And if he had some subject to rule over, there was some location for the kingdom. And where was it? Well, naturally, on the earth if it was under the clouds. All this gives us a, a pre-Adamite insight into Lucifer's past, showing us what caused sin on the earth and what caused that flood of Genesis 1-2. It was simply because of the rebellion of Lucifer. Thus this passage, Isaiah 14, 12-14, proves the location of Satan's original kingdom and the time of his fall. It was located on the earth, and his fall was before the days of Adam. In Colossians 1, 15-18, we read that Christ created thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers in heaven and in earth. Now, they were located somewhere in the heavens and on the earth. Our Lucifer could not have had one of these thrones and could not have been one of these rulers over a principality or a dominion. His own subjects, Lucifer's own subjects at this time, the time of his fall, were earthly creatures, not heavenly. They were not the angelic beings, they were earth creatures, for they lived on the earth, and they're called here nations in the plain literal sense. God created the earth to be inhabited with earthly creatures, not heavenly creatures, as plainly stated in Isaiah 45, 18. And since they are called nations in this passage, why, it is very clear that there had been nations on the earth before Adam's fall and before Lucifer's fall. Now, here we have a statement in Ezekiel 28, 11 to 17, another description of Satan's pre-Adamite rulership of the earth. Now, the description of Lucifer before he fell and showing his position on the earth was one of perfection and one of perfect harmony with God before he decided to rebel. Now, listen how clearly this passage reads. Thus saith the Lord, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to the earth, before the sight of all them that behold thee. Now this is a plain statement, you see, of 
Lucifer, a cherub that ruled the earth and was perfect in his ways from the day of his creation till iniquity was found in him. This teaches that he was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, that he had been in Eden, the garden of God, that he was the ruler of the earth at that particular time, that he was a created being, that he was the anointed cherub, and his position was that of dominating the earth. Every precious stone was his covering, and it pictures his perfection before the time of his creation, or from the time of his creation till the time of his fall and how he became a sinner through pride and through his own beauty, and led an invasion into heaven to cast God down. But we have a statement here that he was defeated and cast out of heaven. Thus we have a statement in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14, and Ezekiel 28, 11 to 17, two scriptures describing Lucifer's pre-Adamite state, and proving that he actually invaded heaven, proving that he had a kingdom on the earth before the days of Adam, and fell, transgressed against God, and invaded heaven, and we can say it again with no hesitation whatsoever, and with every degree of assurance from the scriptures, that the cause of the flood of Genesis 1-2 was because, was the cause of Lucifer was caused by Lucifer's fall and the fall of the pre-Adamite world. Again, friends, we come to you with another message on God's plan for man concerning the original earth made uh, flooded and cursed, or the pre-Adamite world. Now, we gave you scriptures in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, and Ezekiel 28, 11 to 17, to prove that there were inhabitants on the earth before Adam, and that Lucifer ruled the earth at that time, and that through pride he fell and invaded heaven and was defeated, and that's what caused the flood on the earth, the chaotic state of the earth as described in Genesis 1-2, before the six days of the restoration of the earth in the days of Adam. Now we give you some more scriptures on the same subject. Jeremiah's teaching on the overthrow of the world before Adam. Jeremiah 4, 23 to 26, and listen to it carefully. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they tremble, and all the hills move lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will not, will I not, I will not make a full end. Thus you have the idea of God picturing to Israel in Jeremiah's day, the original earth, how it was made totally desolate, picturing to Israel how the land of Israel would be desolate during the Babylonian captivity. And yet God added here, I will not make a full end as I did with the pre-Adamite world. Now the facts in this passage are very clear. That there is a contrast made here between the whole earth being totally desolate and the land of Israel being partially desolate is very clear. The purpose was to show how God was going to curse Israel and yet not make a full desolation of Israel's land as he did the pre-Adamite world. And we have a statement here that the earth was or became without form and void. Hebrew, tohu, vabohu, literally waste and ruin or desolate and empty as described in Genesis 1-2 and as we've discussed before. We have a statement here that the heavens were in existence as well as the earth but their lights were withheld from shining on the earth, thus causing the total darkness of Genesis 1-2. We have the fact that there were mountains and hills on the earth, and they were shaken by a mighty earthquake, which no doubt caused the remains of animals to be deposited in the depths of the earth beneath many layers of solid rock, as we now find in the earth. And also that there had been men on the earth, for he said there was no man left. There had been birds, for he said the birds of the heavens were fled. There had been fruitful places, but now they were a wilderness. 
there had been cities, and naturally inhabitants, and people on earth who made those cities. But now there wasn't one city left, not one city standing. That these cities were broken down, vegetation completely destroyed, men all gone, animals totally destroyed by the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger, is a plain revelation here in Jeremiah 4, 23 to 26. That there was a social system on the earth consisting of earthly creatures is very clear in this passage. This social order was completely destroyed. Jeremiah was shown in vision the total destruction of life on the earth. Then there must have been such a judgment causing the chaotic condition of the earth as described in this passage and also in Genesis 1-2. I repeat again before the six days of the restoration of the earth from that chaotic state to a second habitable state in the days of Adam a little over 6,000 years ago. Now then, this passage refers to a time before Adam, as anybody can see for himself if he'll ask himself just a few questions. Now take your Bible chart before you again, please, and you'll notice that uh, this uh, second ball is the place we are studying now, the pre-Adamite world cursed. I want to ask you some questions now. In the next period, there is the six days of the restoration of the earth and the seventh day that God rested. Now, Adam was created on the sixth day of those six days. Now, just ask yourself the question, has there ever been a time from Adam's day till our day in the dispensation of grace, the eighth or the ninth ball on that chart? You'll notice the ninth ball where you have the river of death. That's the age in which we now live, what we call the dispensation of grace. Has there ever been a day from Adam's day to our day that Jeremiah could have ever seen the earth totally desolate without a man, without a bird, without a city, without any fruitful places whatsoever? No, there, was, there has never been a time and never will be a time as revealed in the scripture that that could possibly be true from that time, from Adam's day to our day. Now then, ask yourself another question. Has there been a day from Adam's, from uh, our day, or will there be a day rather, from our day into all eternity, that the earth will be totally desolate, that there will not be a man on the earth and not a bird, not a fruitful place and not a city left standing? No, the Bible reveals that from our day into all eternity there will be eternal generations of natural peoples and that animals will continue on the earth, and that the earth abideth forever. We have a statement in Psalm 104, 5, which plainly says that the earth abideth forever. In Ecclesiastes 1, 4, we have another statement. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. We have a statement in Genesis 8, 22, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, summer and winter, and cold and heat, and day and night shall not cease. And in Genesis 9, 12, you notice the time of the flood. You see the rainbow up above the ark on your chart? That illustrates the time of the flood and the rainbow that God showed Noah. God said to Noah, you see that rainbow? That's a token of a covenant between me and you and all flesh that is with you for perpetual generations. Thus, these and many scriptures prove that there never will be a day from our day into all eternity that the earth will be totally desolate as described in Jeremiah 4, 23 to 26. Thus, where are we going to associate this passage of Jeremiah with any other scripture? And at what time? Are we going to associate it with some scripture since the days of Adam? That wouldn't work at all. We would have to associate it with scriptures on earth, or with a period on earth, before the days of Adam. And we'd have to associate it with Genesis 1-2, where we read, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the water. Moses saw the earth in the same desolate, flooded state as Jeremiah saw it. And since there never was been such a desolate condition on the earth, from Adam's day to our day, and will never be from our day into all eternity, we have to associate Jeremiah 4, 23 to 26 with 
the time that Moses saw the earth in the, in the same condition as described in Genesis 1-2, and that was before the six days of the restoration of the earth from that chaotic state to a second habitable state in the days of Adam. If that be the case, then that proves there, were, there had been men on earth, birds, fruitful places, cities, and a great war, for every city was broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. Proves that men lived on the earth, inhabitants that who built cities and who lived on vegetation, just like we do. So if that be the case, then here is another indisputable passage of Scripture which plainly proves that there was life on earth before Adam, and therefore there were inhabitants on the earth before the days of Adam. Now we come to a statement of Jesus Christ on the overthrow of the pre-Adamite world. In Matthew 13, 35, Jesus mentioned a, a term from the foundation of the world, which literally means from the overthrow of the world. The Greek word for world here is cosmos, which means social order. And the statement foundation is from a Greek word, ketabalo, which literally means to cast down or to throw down. And it literally should be translated, therefore, the overthrow of the social order that then was. The, over, the overthrow, not the building up. Yet this uh, Greek word ketabali is not the same as the Greek word translated uh, uh, when, used, uh, when an ordinary foundation is referred to. This Greek word literally means the casting down or the overthrow of something. Thus we have a plain statement by Jesus of the dis disruption of the world, not the building up of the world. Thus Christ taught by the Holy Spirit through Matthew and through Luke and through John about the disruption of the world. Matthew 13, Matthew 25, 34, Luke 11, 50, and John 17, 24, and other passages. Now we have Peter's statement on the overthrow of the world that then was in Second Peter 2, or 3, verses 5, 6, and 7. We read, The world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now associate that with the time before that chaotic period on your chart, that second ball. The world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth which are now, that is, since, since the six days of the restoration of the earth, are kept in store, reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And then we have in verse 13 of Second Peter 3 the fact that there will be a new heavens and a new earth. Thus Peter mentions three periods in the history of the earth. The world that then was, the world that is now, and the world that is going to be. Now then, if you'll notice on your chart, that black ball again representing the chaotic period, and understand the scripture this way then. The world that then was before that black ball, before the curse of Genesis 1-2, being overflowed with water perished. And but the world which are, which is now in the next period, the six days of restoration are kept in store, reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men, as pictured at the end of your chart. We're studying now the pre-Adamite world. We pointed out to you before that in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, Ezekiel 28, 11 to 17, Jeremiah 4, 23 to 26, 2 Peter 3, verses 5 to 8, and other scriptures, the Bible teaches that there were inhabitants on the earth before the days of Adam. Now the last scripture we referred you to is found in the third chapter of 2 Peter, verses 5 to 8. For Peter said, The world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now are kept in store, reserved under fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Thus Peter speaks of the world in three great stages. The world that then was before the days of Adam and before the six days of the restoration of the earth as in Genesis 1, 3 through 2, 25. The world cosmos social order that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, since the six days of the restoration of the earth, to a second habitable state, 
He says, This present creation is reserved in store unto the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Well, you'll notice at the end of your Bible chart, the red ball next to the end of the chart there. The next ball to the end of the chart, right under the great white throne judgment. That pictures the renovation of the present heavens and the earth by fire, resulting in a new heavens and a new earth referred to by Peter in 2 Peter 3.13. Not only do the Old Testament writers and Peter and Jesus refer to the pre-Adamite world, but we have Paul and John and others making statements about the same period. In Ephesians 1.4, Hebrews 4.3, and 9.26, we have Paul's references to the overthrow of the world that then was before Adam. In this first reference, he teaches that even as far back as before the foundation, that is, before the overthrow of the world that then was, God planned to restore the earth and provide redemption through Christ, should the new creation fail. According to this plan of redemption outlined in Ephesians 1, 1 to 14, we have revealed that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, chosen us in Christ to be holy, predestinated us to be adopted as children, made us accepted in the Beloved, and redeemed us and forgave us by the blood of Christ, as well as abounding toward us in all wisdom and making known his will concerning all things. In the second reference, Hebrews 4, 3, we have one of the strongest statements in Scripture that the six days' work of Genesis 1, 3 through 2, 25 was since the foundation, literally, since the disruption of the world. It plainly states that God did his works and that they were finished since the overthrow of the world. The works referred to could not be the original creation of the heavens and of the earth of Genesis 1-1. But the six days work of Genesis 1, 3 through 2, 25. For the passage says, God did rest the seventh day from his works. Hebrews 4, verses 3 to 4. If the works in this passage mean the six days work and not the original creation of Genesis 1, 1, and if these works were finished since the disruption of the world, then the passage proves that before the six days there was a disruption of the world and a destruction of the social order that lived on the earth before the days of Adam. In Paul's third passage, Hebrews 9, 26, we have the fact that Christ did not suffer many times since the foundation, literally the disruption of the world, or the social system that lived before this disruption, but that he suffered only once in the end of the world, that is, in the end of the ages, to put away the sin of the world by the sacrifice of himself. That is, Christ came to redeem the present earth rebels who were created since the overthrow of the first earth rebels. Now we come to some statements by the Apostle John concerning the overthrow of the pre-Adamite world. In Revelation 13.8 and 17.8 we have statements that the book of life was prepared since the foundation, since the disruption, literally, the disruption of the world. There would have been no need of a book of life for the present earth rebels until they rebel. Now, since the fall, anyone who conforms to the processes of redemption has his name written in the book of life. Revelation 13.8 and 17.8 do not teach that the names of men are written in the book before they are saved, as some teach, but that the book of life was prepared as far back as since the overthrow of the world that lived before Adam. Each person has his own name written in the book of life when he is born again by the word of God and by the spirit of God and goes through the process of adoption as a child into the family of God. Names can be blotted out of the book according to Exodus 32, 32 and 33, where God said, Him that sinneth against me will I blot out of my book. In Psalm 69, 25 to 28, we have another reference. Let their names be blotted out of the book. And in Revelation 3, 8, Paul, or Jesus warns the churches 
that uh, some names would be blotted out of the book of life. So don't let any man deceive you into thinking that such is impossible. If they do not mean what they say, then these scriptures are false, and they are plain deceptions and cannot be, be depended upon. And if these are, then how do we know but what all scriptures are? And so it destroys faith in the word of God. Let's take the Bible literally, wherein it is at all possible. Take it just as we read it and believe it all, and we'll be able to get along with God and the Word of God all right. Now, if the book of life was prepared since the overthrow of the world, and it has been in existence all the time since Adam's creation, there must have been a social world that lived holy for a time and then rebelled and was overthrown before this present social system. We conclude, therefore, that since Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Jesus, Matthew, Luke, John, Paul, and Peter, and others taught that there was a social world before Adam, there must have been one. So it is just as easy to believe as anything else in the revealed word of God. Now then, did you ever stop to think that this I am giving you is one of the greatest teachings of the Bible? and is one that will stabilize your boys and girls in their schoolwork, in their faith in God. When many In many places they're being taught that we came from monkeys, and that we are product of evolution, and that there, that there were cavemen and uh, half-men and half-monkey that existed billions of years ago. Now, if you'll get this teaching I am giving you and give it to your boys and girls, let them see that there was a world before the days of Adam, and that there were pre-Adamites that occupied this earth an indefinite period, then it will help them to see that if scientists can prove that there were men on the earth longer than 6,000 years and before the days of Adam, that their faith in the Bible does not have to be shaken. All we have to do is recognize that any fact that any scientist can definitely prove can be plainly in harmony with the Word of God and is in harmony with the Word of God if we will associate it with the pre-Adamite world. Did you ever stop to think of what caused the calamity as pictured in Genesis 1-2, and Jeremiah 4-23-26, and Psalm 104-69, and 2 Peter 3, and other scriptures? Why, you, ha you are forced to believe in a pre-Adamite world. God did not create the earth originally a chaos as, as it is in Genesis 1-2. Can the creation and formation of the vast universe and all things therein be found in the record of the six days of Genesis 1-3 through 2-25? Where is it stated in those six days that God created the heavens and the earth? Such statements are not to be found. In other words, God created the heavens and the earth in the dateless past. In Genesis 1-1, Genesis 1-2 pictures the, the earth cursed and placed under the first flood. Genesis 1-3 through 2-25, the work of the six days is solely that of the restoration from the chaotic state to a second habitable state again in the days of Adam. Now then, did you know that we're finding remains of animals in the earth that never have existed since Adam's day? Did you know that? Did you ever come to think, well, when those creatures lived on the earth? Did you ever come to think of a lot of things that we're discovering these days? Try to force those ideas into the 6,000 years since the days of Adam. It cannot possibly be done. So, every time we find definite facts concerning a world that existed a long time ago, we can just have a confident faith in God, that need not be disturbed at all if we'll just realize there was a world on this, on this earth or a social order on this earth, a social system, and people living here before the days of Adam. All the fossils and remains of animals that never have existed since Adam's day, just place it back in that pre-Adamite world, and uh, the Bible will be in perfect harmony. When did all the animals live on the earth that they're finding way down beneath the solid rock, layers of solid rock. When were these animals destroyed? Where, where, where did the demons come from? Were the, they are not the spirits of the, of the Adamite world. 
And why was hell prepared for the devil and his angels, and why is it located in the lower part of the earth? Why would hell be prepared for them if they did not sin before the days of Adam? And why is it prepared for angels if they did not sin before the days of Adam? We have no record of them sinning on earth since the days of Adam because they were already fallen at the time of Adam's uh, creation. So we have to recognize a world before the days of Adam. 